Uh, okay, yeah, my name is Jason Perry. I'm one of Rebecca's PhD students. Um, I graduated in 2015 and now I'm an uh, assistant professor at Lewis University. That's a, uh, a private school in Romeoville, Illinois, uh, about an hour outside of Chicago. I was uh, very happy to be invited to this in honor of Rebecca. Um, this is mostly just a technical talk about our research. I heard there's time for tributes later, but I do want to say that Rebecca took me in when I was an orphaned grad student <laughs> and um, gave me the most interesting problems to work on and uh, full support, which also uh, helps a lot. And I definitely couldn't be in uh, such a good place as I am now without her. Okay. Um, so I'm totally taking advantage of uh, my position as the first speaker in the day to make this a pretty introductory talk, although it is uh, pretty CSE. So I know there's people of different audiences. If you, if you're one of the giants of multi-party computation, there's nothing new in this uh, for you. But uh, anyway, this is work that uh, I worked on uh, with Rebecca and others, and enjoyed very much. Okay, so uh, to start from the beginning. Secure multi-party computation is a subfield of cryptography that deals with a v actually a very general type of problem in which you have a can I come around here yeah. in which you have a group of collaborating parties and they want to they don't necessarily trust each other uh, they each have some data that they want to keep private for themselves and they want to compute some function coming from combining all their data Okay, so you can use <coughs> functional notation for that and say, okay, if there are n parties and uh, each one has an input, then you want to get the outputs for those. Typically, the output is the same uh, for all the parties, um, but it, it can definitely be different. Okay. And uh, it's secure multi-party computation because, as I already mentioned, uh, you want to make sure, the parties want to make sure that their inputs are actually not found out by the other parties beyond, of course, what's implied in the answer that's output. And also, you want to make sure, if possible, that nobody can cheat and, and change the answer to something that, that's not correct based on the input and the function that you've agreed to compute together. Okay, so this is a very general uh, problem. It can be applied in lots of settings, and we hope it will be more. Uh, to say how secure one of these protocols is, we define an adversary model. And uh, most generally, we say there is an adversary who controls some subset of the parties. Okay, so some of the parties you see here are bad guys. And it's not just that they are individually bad guys, but we say that they are all controlled by one adversary, which is a way of saying that uh, they can combine all the data of all the corrupted parties and, and control their actions in a coordinated way. So when we say the adversary, we mean the adversary who is in control, in full control of some subset of the, of the communicating parties. Okay, and so you'll see uh, when we get to the results uh, that have been discovered, uh, most of them are stated in terms of what fraction of the parties can be controlled by an adversary and things still stay nice. Uh, you, uh, still get the right result and uh, nobody's private inputs are revealed. Another way of looking at what we try to do with multi-party computation is uh, simulating a trusted third party, okay. which is to say that doing all this would be completely trivial if there was a third party who we fully trusted, every party fully trusted and could, uh, could do all the computation for them. Because in that case, all that would be necessary is for each party to send their own inputs to this trusted third party. Uh, the third party would, would compute the results and then send, uh, send the results back to the, to the parties without telling anybody what anybody else's input data was. Okay? So is it the second image that's real then? And is it the first that's ideal? Yep, I got it backwards. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. 
much. Yep, yep. So uh, there's a real world and an ideal world. I usually say real first, but yeah, this, this slide has the ideal on the left. So please uh, swap that. This is what we have. Uh, maybe your ideal is totally dangerous. In the real world, yeah, maybe. <laughs> That's right. Um, so in the ideal world, we don't have such a third party. All we've got is each other, and some of us may not be trustworthy. Okay. I uh, could talk about applications of this, but actually I saw that Rebecca actually has a paper that uh, came out as a preprint very recently uh, talking about some of the major applications of secure computation. Um, but anything I just want to say in general, think about this, is, uh, this picture is from an application or is meant to indicate an application in personalized medicine, uh, which says that uh, Maybe I've got some confidential data about my health history in different databases. Uh, I'd like to have some, <coughs> you know, function computed on those that gives me, I don't know, the best uh, advice for a treatment or something. Um, but I don't want any of the holders of that private data to, to share that data directly. Okay, so personalized medicine, that's one application. Um, Anything where you want to draw conclusions from multiple private databases, things like auctions and online deal making. I almost uh, dread to mention the, uh, the beat auction because that application is getting pretty old now. But uh, was, it, uh, was it in Denmark? I think it was the Danish beat auction that was uh, one of the first real world applications of multi party computation. Um, <coughs> so the farmers need to, to set the price of of beats each year. And they need to do this, they want to do this without revealing, you know, how much they've produced to each other. Okay. So in this talk, as much as I can get through anyway, uh, I'll talk about some of the basics of multi-party computation, just give you a couple hints about the technicalities of what it takes to make such a protocol, talk a little bit about how it's been uh, improved since the early days, the early results are very, very important in this field and, and remain so. So that's my excuse for sticking to those a lot in this talk. And then I'll finally uh, get to some work that I did uh, with Rebecca and uh, Joan and Dubai and Gupta uh, with uh, trying to make sense of the landscape. That's where the title of this talk comes from. Okay. So uh, just to, to be general, multi-party computation protocols, they are cryptographic things. Uh, they use a variety of techniques from uh, computational complexity, cryptography. There will be, as you see, two kinds of uh, security that these protocols have. One is uh, unconditional or information theoretic security. Uh, other types have security that depends on computational hardness assumptions. Okay, so if you know anything about uh, the P versus NP question, it's uh, assumptions of that nature that certain functions have no efficient algorithms. Um, yeah, and protocols are, are in some sense a, a mixed bag. Everyone has a different set of assumptions. These are pretty complex objects uh, in the world of cryptography, you know, compared to things like, uh, you know, digital signatures or symmetric encryption. They just have more moving pieces in general. Okay. There is something called a basic model, though, that we define a lot of the protocols in, which is that each party has a private channel uh, that allows them to communicate with each other party. That's a basic thing. Although, uh, you'll notice right away that this sort of thing is very hard to get in the real world, even this. So we use, the reason we use cryptography is because we don't really have private channels, right? And we like to use uh, math to to emulate as much as possible a private channel. Uh, so I'm showing this just because, if I remember correctly, it's one of Rebecca's favorite, uh, uh, favorite pieces of math or basic results. I think, yeah, it's such a, a neat concept that everybody in computer science should know about it. So uh, here it is. It's called Shamir Secret Sharing. Okay, uh, it's, uh, it's an unconditional unconditionally secure mechanism. Okay? And it starts from the fact that most people learn in algebra. It's that if you have t plus 1 points, those uniquely define a polynomial of degree t. 
And if you have less than that, they don't. Okay. So here's what you do. Oh, I should talk more about what secret sharing is. Okay. So secret sharing means I have a secret and I somehow want to distribute that secret. I want to deposit that information with a group of other people, like the other parties I'm doing a secure computation with, but I don't want to I don't want any of them individually, at least, to be able to find out what that secret is, okay, maybe until a later date. So that's what secret sharing is. It's a very necessary ingredient of secure multi-party computation. Okay, so we call the person who has the secret the dealer. Yeah? Sorry, so the, so the group, so what are the individuals, blur, so you're withholding <coughs> something from, I, I guess I'm not understanding what you're sharing versus what you're withholding. Okay, well, it's kind of like you're, you're dividing up a piece of data among a group of people so that if a sufficiently large group of them get together, they can reconstruct that piece of data, but uh, <coughs> individually or in smaller groups, they can learn little or nothing about what the value of that is. So the basic piece of data is, of course, you could think of it as a number, or in this case, an element of a, of a finite field you know, any abstract algebra. But you can just think of it as a number. Okay, so um, how can I chop up a number and give it to this many people um, so that individually no one can know what it is, but if they get together in a big enough group, they can reconstruct it. Okay. Uh, so this property of algebra of polynomials uh, gives us this property pretty much all by itself. So if it's my secret, I'm the dealer, and I will generate a random polynomial. Okay, so the picture on top is, of course, a, a polynomial or a function uh, in the real numbers. But uh, in reality, when you've got a finite field, we like discrete values in computers. It would, if you plotted that, you wouldn't see anything at all. You'd just see like a nice mess, which is good for cryptography, by the way. Okay, and the secret that we want to uh, want to share is we, by default, by convention, make that the value of the function at zero, which is nice because that just means it'll be the, the coefficient of x to the zero. Okay, otherwise the polynomial is generated randomly, and then to share shares of the secret, uh, the dealer will distribute values of the function to all the other parties. Okay. So, um, it's a degree t polynomial, so if t plus one parties combine their information, they can reconstruct, they can do interpolation, which is a basic algorithm, and get the secret back. Uh, but if fewer than t parties uh, share information, then they have no way uh, to find the secret because the original polynomial is just not determined. Okay, and you can show uh, that this is, it's actually, if we use a finite field, the secret value is uniformly distributed. So that's as good as security uh, can get. You can literally know nothing about which element of the field the secret is until you have t plus one people putting their data together. Okay, okay so uh, given that, I want to talk about at a high level one of the most uh, fundamental uh, multi-party seminal results. Uh, the protocols, there's actually more than one in this paper from 88, Ben Orr, Goldwasser, and Vigerson. Pretty long time ago, but still an important result. It is actually an unconditionally secure result, which means we're not making any computational assumptions to say that this is secure. Okay. So um, the underlying mathematical model here is arithmetic circuits, values over a finite field again. So you can express basically any computation you want as a, as a circuit of this type uh, with gates that can take their inputs and add them together, multiply them together, or multiply by a constant. Okay, theoretically you could translate any, any algorithm uh, you want into this model. And then the results are for two different adversary models. Um, that we'll talk about. One is called passive or honest but curious, although I don't like that name, and the other is fully uh, malicious. Okay, so, um, and this has been carried down to the present day when they talk about results in multi-party computation. So honest but curious, 
uh, means that the adversary is not going to do anything to actively disrupt the computation. They're going to follow the protocol. The only thing this adversary, remember who controls a subset of the parties, the only thing they might do is try to correlate the data, examine the transcript of the computation that they see from the parties that they control, and from that try to learn something that they shouldn't. Okay, break the privacy requirement, basically. That's the honest but curious or passive model. So that's the only one I'll really talk about in any detail. Um, so the big idea in the BGW protocol um, is that computation is done on the shares. So secret sharing is the basis of the whole thing. So if there are n parties, each of them will distribute their input. They'll use Shamir secret sharing. Um, to distribute their inputs to the other parties uh, using a polynomial of, of degree that's less than half uh, the number of, of parties. And then once you do that, a nice thing is that the operations of addition and multiplication, okay, so, so it's basically three steps. They share their inputs, uh, they jointly compute this arithmetic circuit, and then they combine their inputs to all get the result. That's, that's the BGW protocol in a nutshell. And a nice thing about it is that in the process of evaluating this arithmetic circuit, um, we say that addition and scalar multiplication, uh, those kind of gates are free. In that uh, if you have uh, an addition gate, you can take the shares that you have and add those together and they will, uh, the result you get when it's combined with the other shares will actually give you uh, what you should get if you add the original values together. Okay, so these kind of gates can just be computed individually uh, by each of the parties. Okay. Uh, the hard part of the protocol is when you hit a multiplication gate. Okay, and that works, you start the same way by each party multiplies their shares together um, but then you get in some hot water because uh, the result when you do that could have a higher degree. It could be a higher degree polynomial and uh, it will not be randomly uniformly distributed in the same way. So this is where it gets complicated. There are what's called re-randomization and degree reduction protocols at that point. Okay, and then at the end as I said the party shares are combined to produce the result. And this is secure against as long as less than half of the parties are controlled by the adversary. Um, and it's this passive or honest but curious model. That's the protocol remains secure. Okay, it remains uh, the uh, participants' data remains private. In the same paper, um, there is a, a protocol for. Uh, security against a more malicious adversary who will act arbitrarily. And we say what that means. That can mean they can do anything. Uh, they don't have to follow the protocol. They can do whatever they want to. But to give an example of what the malicious adversary might do, they could say lie about the shares that they have, right? They could give results that are not computed uh, on the shares that they actually receive, but on values that they've made up uh, through colluding or coordinating among these corrupted parties could do things like uh, make the output reveal more than was intended about the other party's private inputs. So think that, that sort of thing when we talk about malicious corruption. Okay. So uh, the way that they uh, got this more secure protocol against these kind of malicious adversaries is uh, with a, a technique called verified secret sharing. So secret sharing kind of remains the crux of this. Um, verified secret sharing actually lets you do secret sharing in the uh, presence of some parties who may lie. Okay. So verified secret sharing says that as long as no more than a third of the participants are, are corrupted or adversarial, uh, you can still actually reconstruct and get the correct original uh, value back. That's verified secret sharing. Okay, uh, if you know anything about error correcting codes, it's closely related to that field of research. Okay, so long story short, 
uh, the malicious, the secure protocol in this paper allows uh, security for up to, uh, or less than, rather, in over three corrupted parties. Okay, and this was one of the early big results. I'll talk about one more. Um, but this was a big deal, of course. It showed that it is possible, at least given these bounds on how many of your collaborators are, are bad guys, what you can actually uh, compute. Okay. So, uh, in fact, in the original paper, uh, these limits of n over 2 in the passive and n over 3 in the malicious model were tight. For the model, for the assumptions they made, you actually cannot do any better than that. Okay, so in some sense, this was uh, decided at the beginning, but of course, there's many, many different models and many different assumptions you can make. Another early result that says if there is a broadcast channel, you can have a protocol that's secure for anything less than half of your parties being corrupted. And a broadcast channel means just what it sounds like. It means one party can send a message to everybody, and everybody can be confident that the same message uh, came to, to every other party. That's actually very hard to guarantee uh, all by itself. Okay, um, you can do it with protocols um, um, for what's called Byzantine agreement. Um, how much time do I have left? About ten minutes. Ten minutes, okay, no problem. Okay. So uh, these early results kind of uh, set the boundaries, but can we do better? Well, the answer is yes if we make some more assumptions or relax some of the requirements. Okay, so this uh, BGW result I mentioned is in uh, the uh, unconditional security model uh, where no computational assumptions are made. If we want to say, okay, I think the bad guys will be polynomially bounded and I want to assume, you know, P is not equal to NP plus some more stuff, then we can do a little better. And in fact, we're always doing this in the real world anyway with any kind of encryption we use. So it's reasonable. Okay. Uh, if you assume one-way functions, which are the foundation of symmetric key cryptography, you can use zero-knowledge proofs in your constructions. I won't get into that, though, in any detail. And if you go further and you assume the foundational uh, math needed for public key encryption, which is trapdoor functions, you can, of course, get rid of the private channels assumption altogether and just say, okay, I'm going to... Uh, you know, do Diffie-Hellman key exchange with the other parties and set up an authenticated uh, private channel that way using cryptography, which is what we always do anyway when we surf the web or whatever. Okay, uh, so the early result that, that's in the computational security model is uh, Goldreich, Macaulay, and Vigerson. Yeah, I got it right. Okay, so uh, it tolerates up to n over 2 maliciously corrupted adversaries, but it doesn't need a broadcast channel. Okay, it's doing everything with cryptography. And the way it gets uh, malicious uh, security, in contrast to the verified secret sharing, it does use ze zero knowledge proofs. And if you know anything about zero knowledge, you can basically use that to, to force the parties to prove to each other that they have followed the protocol directly. That's the big idea of, of how that works. The other thing we can do is say, okay, we don't need such perfect, well, we've already given up perfect security. We don't need such strong re security requirements. Okay. So the original uh, BGW protocol against malicious adversaries, it's able to guarantee that all the honest parties will receive the correct output, no matter what those less than a third bad guys do. Um, all the honest parties will get the right answer, all their inputs will stay private. So that's the strongest type of guarantee, of course, and you can imagine relaxing that somewhat. So that's called guaranteed output delivery. Uh, other protocols that, that kind of let us break through this uh, half, half the people are bad uh, boundary is we give up guaranteed output delivery and uh, we settle for what's called fairness. Okay. What fairness means is that any party receives the correct output only if all the honest parties, which is kind of reasonable. It's to say, okay, the bad guys could, 
if nothing else, they could refuse to participate. Or they could stop the computation halfway through, run away with what they've got, and then nobody else would receive the answer. But if a protocol is at least fair, then the bad guys would not receive the answer either. Okay? So it's fair in the sense that if anybody, anybody gets the output, all the honest parties will. Okay? And this allows you to go all the way up to say, I don't trust anybody else. Everybody else except me might be corrupted. A little paranoid maybe, but we're looking for the result, strongest results we can get. Right? So this is the category of uh, no honest majority. We can break into that. Um, but this uh, result in this came early too. Another thing I just want to mention in passing, I'm running short on time, uh, further guarantees can be had by including a trusted setup phase. And this is almost like uh, you have to be careful with this because, of course, if you do have that fully trusted third party, then you have no problem left to solve. It's trivial. Right, so the idea is, of course, to minimize uh, the amount of trusted setup that I include. The trusted setup should probably not be dependent on the input or even the function that I want to collaborate to compute together. Just think of it as some kind of like service you know, out there that's going to uh, give me something before I start that I can use as a basis for trust. And the most common thing uh, that we use for that is called a CRS or a common random string. You can actually do a whole lot just by saying, the only thing my trusted party is going to do is generate uh, a random string of bytes and give that same random string to everyone. And I know that everyone has the same string, random string as me, and that it's random. Okay? Um, this allows something called universal composability, which I definitely won't get into right now. I bring this uh, issue of trusted setup up because we're actually using that every day. So another analog of the trusted setup situation is the public key infrastructure of the internet that we use every day. If you know anything about public key certificates, uh, our web browsers rely on what's known as certificate authorities to verify that the public key of, say, Amazon.com is actually Amazon's public key so that when we visit that website and type in our credit card number, well, it's encrypted, but how do we know that it's Amazon who's able to decrypt it? Well, that's uh, a problem that's not really solvable with cryptography, but we have this, these trusted parties called certificate authorities that do that for us. So that's an example of exactly the kind of trusted setup um, that would make these protocols stronger and that may seem like uh, a lot to swallow, but in the real world, we're doing it every single day. We're trusting these certificate authorities. Okay. And when you have this, you can also uh, do the work of emulating a broadcast channel, which I mentioned earlier. Okay. Uh, beyond that, what do you want to do? You want to make it faster. Okay, let me jump through this really quick. Um, just to tell you, the BGW protocol is pretty slow. It's polynomial, which for a computer scientist is good enough, right? It's polynomial, we're done, we go home. But uh, in the real world, uh, it's not really practical. Uh, in the worst case, when you've got bad guys and you've got to compensate for them, you can get up to n to the sixth communication uh, complexity. That's in the, num in the number of parties for, uh, for each gate in the circuit, which is bad. So uh, different ways that people have worked to make these protocols faster are to have a, a function-independent pre-processing stage. Okay. All right, so in my remaining three minutes, uh, let me talk about some stuff that we did, making sense of all these results. So uh, uh, Rebecca and I and others saw the need to, uh, to help new researchers get up to speed on, on this large body of results maybe to help new researchers understand uh, where they can make a contribution, and ultimately to help adopters understand what, what protocol could be a good fit to their problem. Okay, so we basically undertook this uh, systematization effort. We made a set of what we called axes for classifying all the different features of multi-party protocols. We classified them and we made a little tool that lets you sort of explore the landscape of multi-party computation. So 
Uh, you can visualize axes as something like this. Think of a sliding scale for how secure or how many bad guys my protocol can tolerate. I could fill in the dot for a given protocol and compare it to other protocols. We did that. Uh, we made 22 of these axes. Okay, uh, so that you can say, okay, when one uh, axis slides this way, another one has to slide the other way because we know it's impossible to do any better than this in this scenario. That's what we mean by systematizing multi-party computation. Okay. These are all our axes. I just flashed them up there. A couple of them I've, I talked about in the, the first part of this talk. Okay. And so uh, the result is when you have a theorem like this from the literature, like if you want unconditional security against uh, a malicious adversary uh, to do better than uh, n over 3, you have to have a broadcast channel. Okay. Well, we chose our axes in such a way that you can code, encode this, uh, this theorem simply in terms of the axis, saying if you slide this one too far this way, you can't slide the other one too far the other way. That's it, pretty much. Okay. And then we made a little tool. Uh, that you can play with where you actually slide some of the axes up and down, you check some boxes, and in this window you see a, uh, a list of papers with protocols that satisfy those definitions. Okay. Well, um, this sort of thing is of course impossible to keep up to date because the research moves so fast, um, but we hope it could still potentially uh, uh, be useful. Okay, so it tells you when you're trying to do something that's impossible and potentially could, uh, could point you in the right direction. Okay. Um, this work, I, you know, every piece of research that comes out, there's, uh, there's your grand ambition and there's what actually comes out, right? So, so what I had actually envisioned was something that uh, could actually be connected to implementations on the back end. Um, <coughs> Before I was an orphaned grad student, I did some work in programming languages, so that's kind of another thing for me. Wouldn't it be cool if you could have a tool like this? Uh, you could tie it into some actual implementations or implementations of pieces of multi-party computation uh, that would actually uh, compose them into a library that would, that would do uh, that work for you. Just a thing I want to throw out there. Okay. Uh, Thanks for your attention. Thanks again, Rebecca. I'll take any questions you might have. Since they have a, a longish break after this <coughs> next talk, if anybody has any questions, we can take a question or two. Do you have a bibliography of the papers that you cited? I know some of them were recited in short form. Yes, yes. Another uh, piece of the work that we did was make a pretty big, actually annotated bibliography. Um, it's, yeah, it hasn't been kept up, up to date, but I can definitely share that. Uh, yeah. This is maybe a naive question, but My favorite are, kind, yeah. are there, uh, is there interest in the levels of maliciousness, so a certain amount of power that goes with a malicious actor? Yes. So. Uh, um, another feature that people say is uh, how, how malicious will a, a, a bad guy be. Yeah, so there are, are actually things on the axis between you know, passive or honest but curious and fully malicious. And just to give an example, one, one spot on that axis is what's called a covert adversary, uh, who will be an adversary who will be malicious uh, only so far as they can be without getting caught. Okay, which sort of makes sense for what a bad guy might try to do in the real world. So that's actually, yeah, a point on that axis between passive and fully malicious. People have even tried to bring things like game theory into it, right? Will they, how much will the bad guy gamble in terms of maliciousness uh, in order to try to get an advantage? Right. Thank you again. Yeah.